Thank you, Mrs. President. Ladies and gentlemen, according to the wisest, the wise ones of the world, God died a century ago. But we have had to wait until last year for his biography, which is remarkable, considering the speed with which the lives of lesser mortals appear in print. Take Nietzsche, for example, who established God's death. The messenger, whether he brings glad tidings or bad news, often gets more attention than the message. But this is not so surprising. After all, the message is always slanted by the one who brings it. And the more he is involved, the more this is the case. Every biography bears the imprint of its biographer's own autobiography. God's biographer is the distinguished guest of the John Adams Institute this afternoon. And I have the honor of welcoming Jack Miles and giving a short introduction to his book. Mr. Jack Miles is a former member of the Society of Jesus. He studied at both the Papal University Gregoriana in Rome and the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He got his doctorate at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Mr. Miles is a writer and a literary critic. He lives with his wife and his daughter in California. His latest book, God, a biography, has enjoined critical acclaim. He has been awarded the Pulitzer Prize. The book is now a national bestseller and has recently been translated into Dutch. Simplicity is the hallmark of truth, as it is the case here. Mr. Miles' starting point is as simple as it is obvious. Furthermore, his aim is modest. True to the Jesuit tradition that shaped him, he knows where to draw the line. It was not Mr. Miles' intention to write the biography of God, though that would have been perfectly understandable considering the hundred years it has taken for such a book to appear. No, Mr. Miles' only intention was to write a biography of God. Other biographies are likely to follow Jack Miles' initiative. In my introduction, I shall attempt to elaborate on the structure and purpose of Miles' book with reference to newspaper reviews. Then I shall try to present a few points for discussion but first, to digress a little, I would like to ask this question. As a European, I have always been surprised at the way the President of the United States of America ends his speeches to the nation. I find it less surprising, perhaps, where Bush or Carter are concerned, but it is a different matter when it comes to Clinton and Reagan. The case 
with which the latter pronounces his closing sentence, God bless you all, or God bless the United States of America, really takes me aback. I realize, of course, the U.S. is the land of the unlimited opportunity, but I wonder what it means for the most vacuous nation on earth when the blessing of a dead God is bestowed on a living nation. Just who is this biography about? Miles' biography limits itself to the Jewish Bible. The Old Testament for the Christians, which for them is completed by the New Testament. According to the Christians, the Jewish Bible or Old Testament divides into three, the law, the books of wisdom, the prophets. The Jews, however, refers the last two parts, so in their Bible, the, con the, the sequence is law, prophets, books of wisdom. And this is the sequence chosen by Miles. Why? Perhaps because it allows him to unfold God's character in a for him satisfactory way. In the first part, God acts. In the second part, God speaks. In the third part, God is silent. In the first part, God lay down the law. In the second part, he speaks through the prophets. In the third, in the third part, God's people are speaking. God's silence which in Miles' train of thought becomes his silent absence, is termed a brilliant observation by John Barton in the New York Review of Books. On the other hand, A. A. Spijkerboer, writing in the Protestant newspaper Trouw, only notes that the reason God doesn't speak in those books is because he is listening to the response of his people. Ludo van den Einden, writing in what is probably a Flemish paper, says that while Miles doesn't have the last word on the matter, to read Miles is to reread the Bible. Maarten het Hart, in the liberal newspaper NRC Handelsblad, finds it quite unbelievable how Miles can produce, I quote, such an astonishing number of new insights on the book, end of the quote, which the writer from Maas Sluis knows, as we all know, like the back of his hand. Admitting at the same time that his observation is slightly biased. In the standard der letteren, Bert Klaarhout concludes that Miles eccentric study is a postmodern interpretation in which the dissection of God's personality gives, quote, contemporary answers to contemporary questions. In his view, this is, quote, no turning point in the study of the Bible. Some Interpretations will even be ridiculed by the scriptures interpreters. End of the quote. In contrast with Klarhout, Michiko Kakutani writes in the Times of a scintillating work of literary scholarship the will that will forever color, if not downright alter our conception of the Bible as a work of art. Who is the God 
in Miles' book. For me, God is a human, all too human God, as volatile and contrary as the people. A God who, like the people, must learn the hard way from his mistakes. One who finally, in his old age, after the confrontation with the formidable opponent Job, scornfully holds his tongue. Which method did Miles choose? A literary one. He treats the Bible as a piece of literature and God as a literary character. He simply reads through the Jewish Bible and observes how God develops, as it were, from a multiple into a single divinity. The Lord is not necessary to impetrinable mystery according to Isaiah or the unmoved mover according to the Aristotelian tradition. Dr. Jack Miles plumps for a literary approach to the Bible. He discards the historical or theological approach, realizing that different questions yield up different answers and different methods, different results. There is nothing wrong with this. But is it possible to take a purely literary approach? And if it is, can such an approach do the subject justice? I can take a mathematical approach to a painting or, st or study a poem linguistically, but to what extent would this enable me to penetrate to the core of the painting or poem, which both live by virtue of the quality, not the quantity, and of what cannot be said? Does not a purely literary approach to the Bible, in your, for example, the Formgeschichtliche Methode introduced by Hermann Gunkel in 1925? In this method, researchers are expected to take into account the oral tradition preceding the written one which subsequently undergoes a complete development before acquiring its definitive form of separate books of the Bible we know today. Then there is the question, why were these books canonized in precisely this form? It seems that there is no such thing as a purely literary method. Dr. Miles' genre of Joyce, biography, is inherently both historical and literary. Therefore, I personally don't believe you can compare the, the biblical literary vacuum of God as Miles does with the Shakespearean literary vicar Hamlet of Hamlet. Moreover, I don't think his book would have had such a reception had it claimed to be purely literary. No, an integral part of the subject matter got are perceptions and emotions about belief and disbelief in God. Oscar Wilde's saying, art is quite useless, is as irrelevant here as another of Oscar Wilde's statements. <laughs> 
No man is rich enough to buy back his past. The Bible, of course, is also literature. It can't be regarded as only literature. Finally, does not God's silence, as experienced by Dr. Miles in the last part of the Jewish Bible, denote a blissful silence? Silence as God's geology, tibi silentium laus. Is God's silence not a listening? And does his peace not lead to the New Testament, where God is love itself, according to John? Not divided, but constantly one, not changeable, but ever the same, not longer human, but divine. If only Jack Miles had included the New Testament in his biography to further a different interpretation of the Judeo-Christian Bible, perhaps realizing himself that God's apparent absence in the Old Testament, pardon, in the Old Testament books of wisdom, heralds his presence in the Gospels of the New Testament. Nietzsche's denial of God a century ago nevertheless implies that he is still alive today, declaring, as Nietzsche did, that God is dead or that he is old, as Miles does now, indicates a struggle with God resembling that of Jacob, Jack, with the angel. Thank you. Thank you, Antoine, for that uh, unusually thoughtful and, and uh, provocative introduction. And, uh, and thank you, uh, Anne, uh, for uh, the arrangements that you've made here at the, uh, at the John Adams uh, Stichting. Uh, an American arriving at this building, I think, feels instantly at home from the, from the look of the building and its association with our own uh, early history. And uh, all of the other arrangements only conspire uh, to make an, a visiting American feel even more at home. So it's, it's a pleasure, truly, uh, to be here. And I, I urge all of your support in the future for, uh, for this institution. None of us arrives at the subject of the character of God as a total novice. The existence of God aside, we all already know a little something about his character as traditionally understood before any discussion of him begins. We know from cultural rather than strictly religious experience that God lives in heaven, not at the bottom of the sea or in a sacred tree. We know even if some of us object that God is ordinarily referred to in the masculine gender. We know that he may be called upon for assistance, both personal and national. We all know that he delivers punishments as well as rewards, and so on down a surprisingly long list. Perhaps the most painless way to establish this truth is to consider a God joke or two. There is, for example, the one about the computer hacker who wired all the computers of the world together and then put to it the question, is there a God? There is, now, came the answer. Or consider the question, why wasn't God tenured? According to a junior professor of English, there were essentially two objections. And some authorities doubt that he wrote it himself. 
Number two, the scientific community has had a hard time replicating his results. He never applied to an ethics board for permission to use human subjects, and when certain subjects didn't behave as predicted, he deleted them from his sample. <laughs> the computer joke relies for its comic impact on the fact that you know, you know already, the joke does not have to tell you that God is not a machine. You don't have to believe in God to know this about him. You know that the inherited, culturally transmitted picture of God, whether or not you accept it as the picture of anything that actually exists, is not the picture of a machine. But note again that if, instead of presenting God as a great machine, the joke presented him as a mysterious, natural, and more than natural force, the joke wouldn't work in the same way. It wouldn't be different enough from your received image of God to be funny by definition. Humor would require something further by way of parody. As for the tenure joke, you know that God is not a professor or a scientist. A joke in which God appears as a scientist in a white coat is funny before the white-coated deity speaks a single word. But again, a joke in which he appeared on a throne as some combination of judge and king would not be funny from the outset in the same way. The humor would depend on what he said because we have learned to expect God to be some combination of judge and king. This is what I mean when I say that no one arrives at this subject as a total novice. We who live our mental lives in the common Western civilization have a common inherited understanding of the character of God. Where do we get this understanding? We derive it largely, though by no means entirely, from the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. We also have a common inherited Western ideal of human character, which in point of historical fact has been shaped by centuries of exposure to and ardent imitation of the first ideal. In this way, whether or not you believe in God, your character is affected by God's character. My book, God, a Biography, aims directly to acquaint readers with the story that the Old Testament tells about God. Indirectly, it aims to sharpen readers' understanding of the culturally determined part of their own character by sharpening their awareness of a key source of their culture's inherited characterological ideal. What I attempt to do in this book is, very simply stated, to present God as a literary character. In practice, this literary presentation of God differs from other presentations other kinds of presentation in two key regards. Negatively, it is neither a theological nor a historical presentation. Positively, it is a biographical presentation. Is a non-theological presentation of Theos, God, advisable or permissible or even possible? Some people, I realize, find it blasphemous or otherwise objectionable to speak of God as a mere literary character. But when I do so, I imply no claim, positive or negative, about either the existence or the real off-the-page character of God. Whether or not there is a God in actuality, there is at least a God on the pages of this work. Whatever our ultimate belief in or about God, nothing prevents us from talking of him as we find him on the page. An architectural analogy may help to make this point. An art critic visiting a great cathedral, the Cathedral of Chartres, say, may fall to his knees in prayer on a first visit. A prayerful attitude is what that great edifice intends to provoke in the visitor. And yet on a subsequent visit, the same critic may note the design of the flying buttresses, the famous blue of the stained glass windows, the sculptures carved into the portal, and so forth. 
The second visit does not invalidate the first visit. And there may be a third visit in which the critic, now a faithful Christian again, falls to his knees and prays in a different way because of that second visit. A dialogue back and forth between these attitudes is certainly possible. Similarly, an exploration of God as a literary character on the pages of the Bible does not invalidate the very different exploration that one may make of the Bible for explicitly religious reasons. I stated a moment ago that my book is neither theological nor historical. Of the two abstentions, the more important one, the one that took more effort on my part, was the abstention from history. For perhaps 200 years, almost all secular, that is, non-theological, commentary on the Bible has been historical in its approach. Think of all the books about the historical Jesus. It is impossible, however, to write a book about the historical God. For though there may be a God, there is no historical God. By definition, God transcends history. The dominance of historical criticism of the Old Testament has thus perforce been Hamlet without the prince. Historians could talk about the ancient Israelites, what they believed and when they believed it, but further than that, they could not go. They could not, and they cannot talk about God per se. Literary criticism can go where history cannot go. Wilfred Cantwell Smith, a scholar of comparative religion, once wrote, believers talk about God, unbelievers talk about religion. In that sense, historians are all unbelievers. Religion is the only reality accessible to their methods. But Smith left literature out of his reckoning. Literary critics, whether believers or not, can indeed talk about God. They can talk about him as a literary character. If very few have done so, the abstention is not dictated by their discipline. As for the biographical shape of my own presentation of God as a literary character, some might object that taking the Bible at precisely its own literary word, God is not born and does not die. I recognize the objection, but insist on the validity of a quasi-biographical approach to God because though the Bible recounts no birth or death of God, it does recount a beginning and an end. There is God's first word and his last word, his first action and his last action. There is a path of development that we can chart from, beginning to, from the beginning to the end and carefully attend to what happens along the way. This is, of course, exactly what we do with virtually every book we read. The surprising fact is, however, that for reasons that are at least as much philosophical as religious, this kind of reading, our standard kind of reading, is virtually never attempted for the Bible. Instead, the Bible is read in a recombinatory way whose result, whether intended or not, has been to impose the view that God does not change and by the same token, to marginalize the many moments in which on the pages of the Bible itself, he does indeed change. Religious belief, Jewish and Christian alike, has been heavily affected by Greek philosophical thinking about God. Aristotle believed that ultimate reality, that reality which he called the unmoved mover, was immutable. An Aristotelian attitude toward God tends to entail believing that anything true of him at any one point in the Bible must be true of him at all points, for otherwise he would not be immutable. And this belief about the eternal simultaneity of the text to itself has led in turn to a felt freedom to mix texts from different parts of the Bible with impunity. Any verse can go with any other verse 
because every verse is equally divine. The text is, so to speak, all the same color. It is all him. Historical criticism of the Old Testament mixes texts in a different way than theology does. Historians certainly do not believe in the temporal simultaneity of every verse to every other verse. In fact, they insist on just the opposite. Yet, historians are just as impatient as theologians with any reading of the text that would presume simply to begin at the beginning, continue to the end, and track the changing character of the protagonist as the core of a merely artistic effect. Historians are interested in the historical content of the biblical text. For them, its artistic form is merely an occasional means to their chosen end. Their recipe for dismantling and assembling the text is wholly their own, but they certainly do not take it as it is any more than theologians do. And like theologians, they typically treat it as just one source to be read in conjunction with others. All in all, the Bible has been viewed by both theologians and historians rather as a great sculpture might be viewed. The statue itself is fixed in its position. The viewers are not expected to read it inch by inch from top to bottom. Instead, they circle freely around it. They look at it now from this angle, now from that, now from the first angle again. In reading the Bible, historians uh, and theologians alike skip ahead, double back, join what the text separates, separate what the text joins, rearrange what they find in any order they choose. In God, a biography, I forego this freedom and depart from this well-established religio-cultural habit. Instead, I attempt to view God as we view a motion picture. In a motion picture theater, it is the picture that moves while we remain stationary in our seats. One image follows another, frame by frame. Each image is different. It is the sequence that produces a distinct impression upon us. This is, of course, also the way we read most books. Reading from the first page to the last is very like viewing from the first frame to the last. But this mode of appropriation, utterly familiar as it is, is most definitely not the one our culture has typically applied to the Bible. The recombinatory mode of Bible reading, so familiar in church lectionary and university commentary alike, is distinct and valid in its own terms. Moreover, it is highly stimulating precisely for the extraordinary amount of artistic control and creativity it places in the reader's hands. Any Bible reader may be struck of a Sabbath by the cunning of the lectionary or the resourcefulness of the commentary in juxtaposing just the texts it chooses to juxtapose. Partly because much of the Bible is an anthology, the reader may always second guess and improve on the anthologist. Traditional Bible reading, secular as well as religious, second guesses, improvises and improves with great freedom and rarely recognized élan. It gives every reader some of the exhilaration of being a writer. All the same, this mode, this kind of reading obliterates any artistic intention that may inhere in the original text, not as an arbitrary set, but as an ordered sequence of words and thoughts. And sequence, or to use a more familiar word, plot, revealing something now, withholding something else until later, is perhaps the most basic of all the artistic tools of literature. Language, the artistic medium that literature uses, is not stone. Unlike stone, language is not global and simultaneous. It happens in linear sequence, one vowel, one consonant at a time, word following word, sentence following sentence, and so forth. 
by rehabilitating a kind of Bible reading that respects the sequential character of language, I attempt to restore the integrity and recover the originality of the Bible as art. Reading the Bible in the ordinary front-to-back way in which we read a novel or a biography is not always easy, but it is profoundly rewarding for its power to highlight internal differences in the character of God. When the various characterizations of God that are found in the Hebrew Bible are allowed to arrive one at a time, their singular impact increases tenfold. God then seems to hold several distinct and powerful personalities within one developing, highly dynamic, tension-ridden character. Much that is embarrassing to theology is fascinating to literary criticism. Much, I should say perhaps, is dynamic as art and thereafter fascinating to literary criticism. Much that is irrelevant as history is compelling as art. Though God, a biography, adds nothing to the Bible account, it also omits nothing and glosses over nothing. It is, in that sense, an unauthorized biography whose effect is occasionally shocking but always revealing. Ancient Israel was an originally nomadic nation that encountered the gods of various nations in its wanderings. Even after it ceased to be nomadic, it was continually exposed to what the King James translation calls strange gods. Historically speaking, monotheism did not arise in the pure form all at once. There arose as a first stage the conviction that whatever other gods might have been around, Israel was to worship only one of them. Only later did there arise the further conviction that Israel's was the only God who actually existed at all. However, this further phase entailed more than just negating the separate existence of those other gods. It also, to a very considerable extent, seems to have entailed absorbing the personality content of the disappearing gods into the emerging synthetic character of the one surviving God. Israel's Lord God thus ended up as an amalgam of the gods whom, so to speak, he had vanquished. I leave it to historians to reconstruct the details of this complex historical process. What I examine is the end product, a god, our god, in whom all these initially external differences have been internalized. Christians call the Hebrew Bible the Old Testament and add to it a later scripture, the New Testament. Jews call the Hebrew Bible the Tanakh, an acronym derived from the Hebrew words for law, prophets, and writings, three words that begin with the Hebrew equivalent of our T, N, and K. The contents of the Tanakh are identical with those of the Protestant Bible, but the order is different. In the Tanakh, the prophets come in the middle, as you heard earlier. In the Old Testament, a Christian editor has apparently moved the prophets to the end so that they may immediately precede the Gospels. Jesus Christ, in Christian belief, is, of course, the fulfillment of prophecy. So this order makes good sense in Christian eyes. In a subsequent book, I plan to write about God in the Christian Bible, Old Testament and New Testament together, with special attention to the incarnation as a feat of literary imagination, the imagination of how God's character would have to develop if he were to become man just when he did. My current book talks only about the Hebrew Bible and follows the older Jewish order, the order of the Tanakh. The God in both the Tanakh and the Old Testament is, of course, the same character, and the crucial first third of his story is the same in both editions. I choose to speak of our sacred scripture, our Western scripture, as existing in two distinct editions, the Jewish edition and the Christian edition, which rearranged the order of the Jewish edition and added a new conclusion. 
But the God in both the Tanakh and the Old Testament is the same character, and the crucial first third of his story is the same in both editions. The differences come in the latter two thirds. The broad trajectory of God's life in the Tanakh, as you heard earlier, is action, speech, silence. The trajectory in the Old Testament is action, silence, speech. In both the Old Testament and the Tanakh, however, the crucial formative opening portion is the same. God as God, namely Elohim, may be clearly distinguished in character at the start from God as Lord, namely Yahweh. If together God and Lord make up the Creator, they in turn must be distinguished together from their common dark side, the Lord God as destroyer. Yes, the Lord rebukes the serpent in Eden. Yes, God contains the flood. Yet the serpent is the Lord's own creation, arguably the Lord's own tool. And the flood, in Mesopotamian methodology, interestingly, a flood monster distinct from God, is God's own angry and virtually gratuitous action in our sacred scripture. This line, the interface between creator and destroyer, is the deepest and most permanent fault line in God's developing character. Further tensions emerge as the narrative continues. God as God of, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, is far less a cosmic architect then he is a family friend concerned with private, humble, familial needs. The cosmic creator destroyer we first met was in general above such quotidian concerns. Still later, the Lord becomes a warrior for the first time, the scourge of Egypt, the liberator of Israel and the conqueror of Canaan. Again, as the lawgiver on Sinai and the aggressively jealous liege of his vassal people, he develops a new concern with morality and with international relations, matters that through the whole of the book of Genesis concern him slightly or not at all. Once his people are installed in the land he has conquered and ethnically cleansed for them, the Lord develops an unforeseen new concern for the poor, Again, a matter that has not previously drawn his attention. Still later, in his relationship with David, he speaks of himself as a father for the first time. And in and through that new relationship, he approaches for the first time a semblance of emotionally rich personal love, and so forth. Why did God create mankind? His only declared or half-declared motive was a desire to understand himself. <clears throat> he wants an image of himself, a reflection of himself. The plot of the Tanakh emerges from the dynamism inherent in this original to image relationship. For in creating an image of himself as creator, God creates a fellow creator a fellow image maker, a reproductive sexual species that in the book of Job brings forth a human being who is as aggressively curious about God as God is curious about himself. In that book, the climax of the Tanakh, Job teaches God to recognize that he is indeed a destroyer as well as a creator. The Lord's last words in the Tanakh spoken perhaps more ruefully than judgmentally to Job's friends are, you have not spoken correctly of me, as has my servant Job. Thereafter, God never speaks or acts again, though a dozen books remain in the canon of the Tanakh. We see him for the last time, aged and white-haired, referred to as the Ancient of Days, seated, silent, on a remote and cloudy throne. His key functions have gradually been assumed by Israel itself. He does not die, but at this late point it is not too much to say that his life is over. He subsides, his mission essentially accomplished. Is the Tanakh a tragedy or a comedy? I call it a comedy that narrowly escapes tragedy. The Lord God gets what he wants, and more than he knew he wanted, from his human creature. 
mankind, Israel at any rate, ends up requiring nothing from the Lord God that he has not already provided. True, the last books in the Tanakh, the books of Chronicles, look backward rather than forward, but they do so proudly rather than bitterly. They function rather like the reprise at the end of a musical play. The mood is nostalgic and reconciled rather than either excited or hopeful. All's well that ends well, yes, on the whole, and yet the deep and mysterious tensions within God's character remain unforgettable even in their dormancy. So they were for ancient Israel, and so they are for us. If I may close this talk with the closing sentence of my book, God is the divided original whose divided image we remain. His is the restless breathing we still hear in our sleep. Thank you. God is mentioned in my acknowledgments as uh, a number of uh, reviewers and interviewers have noticed, somewhat to my amazement. I mean, uh, how many people read down the acknowledgments in alphabetical order, but many did, and have asked uh, uh, if the God in my acknowledgments is the same God I write about uh, in, my, in my book. And, and the answer is no. I, I regard uh, the Old Testament, I regard the Bible itself, as uh, worthy of the honor, and it is a great honor indeed that we extend to those who begin. Uh, the first, for any writers in the room, you all know that the first draft is, is the greatest challenge. But I regard the Bible as the beginning, not as uh, the end of our uh, understanding uh, of God. Uh, I'm, I am a, a practicing Christian in the Anglican Confession, uh, at the moment, I, for about 10 years after leaving the Jesuits, I was uh, a kind of religious experimenter or wanderer, and, and this is the, the home that uh, I have come to. And how long will that last, if that's the question? Uh, I don't intend to, to, um, to wander again, uh, but uh, one can always be surprised. I have been. Why did you choose the Anglican Church? I chose the Anglican uh, a, a tradition uh, with uh, the hesitation that uh, anyone uh, of Irish extraction would have to have. I don't have my Irish passport in my pocket, but uh, my, my line of descent from Ireland is, is uh, short enough that Ireland regards me as still Irish and has, <laughs> has given me a passport. Uh, my family are also from the north uh, in Ireland. But I have observed that uh, among the, the perhaps less frequently noted uh, achievements uh, of the European Union has been the Europeanization uh, of Ireland. So among my cousins, there, are, there, are, there is more than one uh, Catholic Protestant marriage. There, is also, uh, there are also two Irish-English uh, weddings. The kind of uh, religious migration that once uh, uh, so astonished Europeans as they observed it in the United States is, is also uh, now, I think, increasingly common here, not that it was ever entirely absent. For a Catholic, the Anglican tradition uh, for, that is for born and raised Roman Catholic, the Anglican tradition offers uh, a liturgy that is uh, a very familiar a theological tradition that is also uh, uh, rich in the same ways and no pope. <laughs> Do you agree more with the high church or with the low church? Well, uh, I'm actually, uh, I'd say, medium, only medium high. <laughs> <laughs> there are certain, there are certain, uh, 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 this may be okay, okay. perhaps too technical for okay, this audience. This, this, <laughs> the second question. Uh, who, oh, if someone wants more about that, ask me afterward. <laughs> okay. Do, um, second question. Why, Ray, who do you think is the brilliant creator of the literary character of God? 
Are you that? No, uh, well, no, but, uh, but, that, but that isn't an irrelevant question. This is, uh, who do you think is the, is the brilliant creator of the literary character of God? The, the question may seem to, to ask after a single author uh, of the Bible and to suggest, as I think you were also suggesting, that there was a single author uh, for Shakespeare's Hamlet, but there are many authors of the Bible. Therefore, how can you uh, claim to be tracking uh, the presentation of a single uh, literary character from the beginning uh, to the end of the Bible. Uh, there are many authors, of course, and historical scholarship has taught us how very many uh, there are. Uh, there is not a single intent, but for anyone who chooses to receive the many mingled uh, intentions, there can be a single effect. Do you follow me? There is not a single intention but there can be a unifying effect brought about by uh, the reception of any individual reader. Before uh, there was my unifying reception, there was a, a very important cultural process. Uh, often the first sentence in the first class of an introduction uh, to the Old Testament will uh, be the surprise for most uh, of, of the students that the word Bible comes originally from a Greek plural, ta biblia, meaning simply the books. That's true and that's interesting, but it's just as important to, to note that ta biblia became biblia, a Latin singular feminine noun, and that uh, in the vernacular languages uh, of Europe, once the definite article was developed, uh, Biblia became la Bible or di Bible and so forth. And uh, that, that process of unification, which is definitely a Christian process, I think, that, that probably uh, I could have, have discussed more in my book than I did, uh, creates a kind of standing invitation to any individual Western person to receive this multiplicity uh, into his own individual personality and make unity uh, of it. And I don't claim that, that my way is the only way. No, I also, I also don't claim, uh, as you point out, you know, in a biography, um, it's also, it's also true that in general, this approach, an aesthetic approach, it doesn't, uh, doesn't rule out other kinds of approach. Yes, but, but I, un I understood the question otherwise. This, but perhaps the, the question can say it itself. You were the person. I thought you, will, you wanted also to know something uh, of, of the side of, of Mr. Jack Miles about this. In, 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 for, in how far are you uh, the creator brilliant creator of the literary character of God. Is, is that a way, what you asked also? Yes. Well, I, um, I don't want to claim too little and I don't want to claim too much. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to deny that there is an artistic and, and shaping presence of myself uh, in, in this book. Uh, at the same time, uh, I am observing a sequence of books rather than taking a group of books that might have appeared in any sequence and, and assigning it a sequence. You see, there, there are very many crucial kinds of literary creativity that weren't mine to exercise. But certainly, what I did do was seize upon the, uh, the very name uh, of God, or the, the small number of names of God, and say, wherever they are used, they are always referring to the same being. I had uh, an interview this morning with uh, uh, a reporter from Knock, and uh, there I made a comparison I've made once or twice before at least, of. Uh, Perhaps you've heard of serial monogamy. You know, uh, uh, we, we say in the West that we are a monogamous society, but actually we have easy divorce, so we have serial polygamy. 
Well, what if, what if ancient Israel was only, uh, was not really monotheistic, but serially polytheistic? It, it worshiped uh, different gods in, uh, at different times. It just happened to call them all by the same name. So, you know, Mr. Schmidt gets married and his wife is called Mrs. Schmidt and he divorces her and he marries another woman who is also called Mrs. Schmidt. He gets rid of her and he marries another one. They're all called Mrs. Schmidt. It would be wrong then to try to unify them and say, what is the character of Mrs. Schmidt? Well, there were several of them, you know. Uh, but, it, but that process, uh, that, that multiplicity, really finally uh, can be, if you choose to, uh, unified in this case. These aren't separate uh, women or separate uh, gods. What they once were is lost in the sands of time. Only historians bother with it anymore. Their only continuing life is, is, a, is as an aspect of this character who remains alive in this literature and also remains alive in our, uh, our religious traditions. I took that seriously. You know, I, I took that, uh, that took seriously the fact that where the same name is used, the same being is being referred to. Therefore, any differences in him have to be regarded as interior differences. I don't believe that anyone has done that before. And that, I think, was probably the, the, the thought that created the book. Thank you. Uh, what ever happened with the small but interesting book of Jonah and the God it presents is the question. And I should like to combine it with a critic in the New York Times book review. Yes. Regrettably, Mr. Miles skips over the bulk of the prophetic literature by excluding Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Hosea, for example. He misses out on important texts of discerning God's developing personality. Uh, for those uh, in the room who haven't um, uh, read the book, I, let me give you this following piece of information. I, I read the, all the books of the Old Testament in order from uh, Genesis, the creation of the world, to the second book of Kings and the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. At that point in the in the Jewish canon, there come Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then 12 minor prophets. I read Isaiah, the first of the major prophets, and the last three of the 12 minor prophets. So I skip Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the first nine of the minor prophets. Why? Well, in retrospect, I, I believe that uh, I could have spoken more briefly of Isaiah and have included uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Uh, Isaiah speaks, as it were, of a disaster that is uh, coming, uh, Jeremiah of a disaster as it is happening, and an Ezekiel of a disaster after it has happened. Uh, I ref have referred to them in this book as uh, the the manic, the depressive, and the psychotic versions of the uh, prophetic spirit. And that, too, would have been satisfying to, um, to follow through on. I regard Isaiah as the greatest writer uh, in the Bible, greater than the author of the, the book of Job. He is equal to the author of the book of Job in eloquence and superior in range. And there was also something, uh, something I think never equaled again in the latter chapters of, uh, of the book of Isaiah. So the, 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 in, the difficulties that were inherent in my sequential form of, um, of exposition uh, became uh, really quite extreme as I contemplated uh, following through all of the, the prophets in order. In retrospect, I think I could have included the three uh, major prophets, but the first nine <coughs> of the minor prophets uh, would have been uh, uh, complicating in, in, in that way. Uh, about the book of Jonah, though, that's an interesting one uh, to, to bring up. I, have, uh, I was asked in Berlin uh, if God has a sense of humor, 
And the answer is uh, not much. <laughs> Mostly, his form of humor inclines towards sarcasm and, uh, and, and, and mockery, but uh, the ne and never at his own expense, uh, it should be noted. <laughs> There is never anything self-deprecating about God, even for the faintest flicker of a moment. Uh, but uh, his humor in the, in the book of, of Jonah is gentle and subtle and wry, one might say, in, uh, in an absolutely unique way. I, I have written an article. It was, in fact, the first, the first published article of my life. Uh, it was published in the Jewish Quarterly Review in 1974 or so. Even then, I was very interested in relations between Christians and Jews, so I published in, in this Jewish journal rather than anywhere else. Uh, Jonah is a kind of satire of the, uh, the prophetic vocation. Ordinarily, in, in Israel, the, the prophet, the true prophet, is reluctant to accept his vocation. Moses is reluctant, and others are, are reluctant. Well, Jonah carries this re reluctance to a comic extreme. He actually runs in the opposite direction, gets on board a ship, and sails for the opposite end of the Mediterranean. I mean, this is really quite, quite extreme. And, uh, the, and the people to whom the prophet preaches are expected to uh, reject, classically they reject his, uh, his prophecy um, and the Lord sends punishment. In the case of Nineveh, the, the, the king accepts the message <coughs> with laughable literalness. He even makes the animals put on sackcloth and ashes and repent. Uh, and, uh, and Jonah, instead of accepting that uh, with joy that the, the Lord's message uh, has been uh, uh, revered, is, is petulant and, uh, and annoyed. So it's a, it's a richly uh, in interesting book. And whoever thought of that question um, really uh, found out my weakness because it doesn't fit into into this uh, sequential order uh, at all well. Uh, and it was painful for me to leave it out, but um, you can't do everything in one book. OK. Um, can you imagine that, you, that, that somebody knows you a postmodern author because you are treating, for instance, uh, Isaiah in the way you did? I mean, postmodern or post-Freudian, or what can you, ex can you say something about that? What I say about postmodernism is that anyone who uses the word isn't the thing. That is to say, you can't be postmodernist if you use the word postmodern. That is because uh, one thing that uh, the, the particular kind of skepticism that uh, postmodernism encourages would rule out is ever being able to say that anything is definitively behind us. We can never say that anything is post or that anything is definitely pre, we're always in an undefined middle. Um, but if there is about uh, post-structuralism, as I would tend to, uh, to uh, prefer to say, and I believe one can say, uh, something that would be valid in talking about what I have done, it would be to say that uh, that in any given work, and perhaps even in reality itself, if you want to be you know, a true anti-realist, nothing is given, everything is found. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, rather, uh, nothing is, is given, everything is made. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, to come back to your question, you know, the very substantial degree of of responsibility that I uh, assign to myself and the implicit invitation to anyone else to do the same thing, there's something postmodern about that. In other words, there are no authoritative or final um, interpretations. I, I regard myself, however, as a, a weakly post-structuralist. <laughs> A weakly uh, postmodern rather than confidently. Also so. middle. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, was, you, spoke, uh, you spoke about reading the Bible from the front to the back there. Yes. 
I thought, who is reading the Bible from the front to the back? I mean, you know, in the Roman Catholic tradition, you, you read something of the Old Testament, something of the letters, and something of the, of the Gospel. I, therefore, I will ask it you, because in the New York Review of Books, there's another critic, as someone whose instincts lie more with historical study of the Bible, I am, however, left with some questions, he said. Yes. A great deal of Miles' analysis is made to hang on the exit form and order of the Hebrew Bible as now recognized in Judaism. And then if I further, uh, a, lot, a little further on, uh, in ancient times, the biblical books were written on individual scrolls, and the idea of order was scarcely present. The use of the codex was more characteristic of Christian culture, you said, but is it, has, has it thus um, pounder as, as, you, as, you, uh, as you write about it? This, I, this too, I think, calls for, uh, for a little sort of factual uh, presentation. You know, we, we speak in the, in the uh, Bible, the Old Testament, of uh, the, the, the book of Jonah, uh, the book of Job. In antiquity, the word book, the word that we translate always as book is sefer, but a sefer was not something that has the shape of a modern book, you know, cut pages sewed together on one side. Sefer referred to a scroll. So in a sense, uh, the Jews are not the people of the book, but the people of the scroll. The, the codex is a Latin word, and the, our, our modern physical form of the book uh, was <coughs> invented in Rome. Uh, the, the word uh, codex comes from codex, uh, bark. The first, the first uh, codices were actually thin uh, panels of wood that, were, that had, were drilled, holes were drilled and thongs were put through them and a few pages of text then could be created. Later came uh, codices made of, of paper and the, uh, the codex was a much more efficient way of storing text than a scroll was. Because if you think of it, a scroll is only written on one side. So half of the paper, half of the writing material is wasted. Uh, nonetheless, as we're all observing now, you know, with internet and, uh, and various kinds of hypertext, and, uh, the, some people are quite hostile to all that. You know? They really don't like that. And, and if you say uh, that your book has been published but only, only on the internet, well, it doesn't seem like it's really quite there, you know, uh, to some people. And in a similar way, the Codex uh, was resisted. Christianity, as a new religion, had no traditions to protect, and it adopted the Codex uh, early and enthusiastically. And virtually all the surviving earliest uh, codices are Christian. What the Codex uh, permitted and this only took place over centuries, it really didn't, uh, didn't take place at a stroke, was progressively larger uh, codices. They, they discovered they could pile those pages pretty thick and still keep them together, keep them from falling apart. At that time, uh, a sense of the order of the various books as something like chapters in a single volume, it seems plausible to me to suppose, though how can, I don't think one can prove it, would have become a more pressing question. The order, once, those, once the different books were, were literally sewed together, their order would seem fixed. And so uh, the people who are producing these larger editions would tend to think about it more. Um, but is the, is, the, is, the, is the order as important as you are saying? The, the, uh, the, the, a Jewish reviewer also uh, in, in a, more out of the way uh, place uh, said that the the order uh, was not fixed until the invention of printing. That really was not until the Sanchino, uh, a, a, a first printed uh, Jewish uh, Bible, that the order was fully fixed at all. But there are lists that that survive from antiquity, and and the gross difference that the prophets are never at the end. The prophets are always in the middle. I think that was so firmly established that it, it can be said to, to uh, have a life independent of, uh, of the codex. The, 
some of the dip of the variation in the order of books within the third part is certainly uh, flexible, and you could do it, you know, in any number of different ways. Here is where it becomes postmodern because it's it's the the determination of of me, the reader, or of some other reader to do it that gives it its importance. It's not just the acknowledgement of some historical importance, but in the broad outlines that uh, the prophets follow uh, the opening uh, narrative portion, that I think is, is really, uh, does have firm and well-established uh, historical importance independent of the codex and, uh, and the fact that Christianity made the change it made uh, seems to me also to be at least plausible in that way. Now, I have a question of uh, Mrs. Reed van Pas. Is that possible? Is she here? Perhaps you can ask her own question. It's me. It's, are you, yeah. Do we, we, we use it? No? Oh. Um, um, but now we know. Who, I, who you are. I have read the beginning at a few fragments only the chapter Does God Love? Mm -hmm. That is very interesting, but at the same time very suspicious. Surprising. Surprising, start here. Is it possible for any creature to live without knowing love and do so many things, perform so many deeds, create? How is this possible? I interrupt uh, this, the story that I tell by following from book to book through the order of the Old Testament several times to ask uh, sort of leading questions about God. The first question is, what makes God godlike? Uh, another one is, does God fail? And then one is, uh, does God love? This goes to the, to the question, to the observation that I made uh, from the podium that we have, uh, in, for religious but also academic reasons, the habit of believing that anything that is true of God at any point is true of him at all points. So if uh, John, in the letter uh, by John, we can read God is love, we must believe that God has always been love, that there was never a time when God was not love. Who told us that? The, the uh, uh, creation is a product of his love, you said, yes. Yes, that this is what she was told, and that, that God's motive was to make us participate uh, in his love. Uh, that, that is a comment, as, as I would put it, on God off the page. Uh, perhaps God made the world, and perhaps that was his motive, but the Bible doesn't report it as such. The Bible doesn't, he, he doesn't say, uh, let us uh, make uh, mankind out of our love for them that they may participate in our love. He says, let us make them in our image. Uh, he, and he, there isn't in the, uh, in the course of uh, certainly the entire book of Genesis any, any reference to uh, love between uh, God and Adam and Eve. They never, never say they love him. He never says he loves them. He never says he loves Cain or Abel uh, or Noah or Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. When he calls Abraham uh, out of Ur, uh, and he doesn't say, I'm doing this because I love you. He doesn't say, I'm giving you, I'm promising you uh, uh, abundant offspring because I love you. That's, that's not the stated motive. Now, is it plausible to believe that it is the actual motive, though not stated? People can love each other very much and never say so, after all. Uh, doesn't seem so to me. The other thing is that uh, the answer is probably every certain time trying to think that we would have offspring <coughs> many, many years. So that does not prove very well. It's just a test. It, al it almost, yes, he almost seems to be toying with him. He, he, he promises him uh, supernaturally uh, uh, numerous offspring and then doesn't give him even one, and then gives him one and, and then uh, asks uh, that he kill it. Uh, this, is, this is, 
not uh, the you know, prima facie, that is not, not a picture of a loving style of, of conduct. Uh, perhaps we can we can uh, speak now about the the, uh, the God the fact that God is silent. Um, the critic in the Protestant newspaper Trouw here in the Netherlands, uh, Mr. Spekerboer, uh, wrote uh, that the reason God doesn't speak in those books is because he is listening to the response of his people. Will you please uh, declare this? This is uh, this is you know. I can only say it attributed and not, uh, not anchored by uh, any verse to which he could point, I believe, in the, in the books that, uh, that, that come at the end of the scriptures in the Jewish order in which God uh, uh, says nothing. The, the attention seems to be directed elsewhere in, t in the attention of, uh, of the writers. For me, the, the book that is most um, uh, telling, most, that gives one most pause in, in this regard of those books that come at the end uh, is the book of Esther. Uh, in the book of Esther, Israel faces genocide as it did in ancient Egypt. In ancient Egypt, as Pharaoh threatened to exterminate the Jews, they cried out, God heard their cry, and came to their rescue with spectacular force. He laid waste the whole land of Egypt, slaughtered the firstborn of the Egyptians, drowned the Egyptian army. He couldn't have rescued them with any greater uh, force and spectacle uh, than he did. In the book of Esther, they face the identical situation. This time it's the king of Persia. He has the same plan, the same method. <clears throat> they don't they don't pray to God. They never even mention God. They handle it on their own. This does not seem to me to be the uh, uh, attitude of a people uh, listening uh, or be who believe that God is, is listening uh, for them to say something. It, it seems rather that they have moved on or that they understand that, uh, that he wishes them to to take care of such matters uh, on their own. I would at least regard that interpretation as, as plausible mm -hmm. as the one that he suggests. Okay, and now a question about the character of God. Is this a uh, scheme? Integrated personality values God's God. So disintegration, splitting, fusion without real integration, God reintegration, and the question, the, 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 um, <laughs> the <laughs> this is Mr. or Mrs. F. de Jonge. Yes, perhaps you can you can explain. We understand well that you have not only a literary approach, but also a psychological approach. And I did not understand that you say God started as a person suffering from a multiple personality disorder. <laughs> <laughs> if so, uh, you can uh, approach that from a psychological standpoint and say, uh, not uh, historically, not religiously, but uh, psychologically, he is the product of an unsuccessful fusion without integration. Perhaps he will grow up and become an integrated old person, but he's not in the Bible. And if you go farther back, uh, you can say, uh, so he's the product of a fusion of part personalities, split personalities, from aspects of persons. Why, where did they come from? Perhaps from a splitting. So that, that, that could be uh, make a, a scheme which uh, can explain not only how the idea of God uh, arose, but also how the idea of the, 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 the polytheistic gods uh, mm -hmm. did work. Mm -hmm. Well, in, in, uh, in the, the history of religions, I mean, one, I think, fairly familiar idea is that primitive societies uh, where every individual person performs all functions. You know, uh, the, the father of the family is, is both the hunter providing the food, builds the house, uh, sings the songs, teaches the stories, uh, that there is a fairly undifferentiated notion of, of God, mana, or, or some uh, kind of world spirit. 
and that uh, after the agricultural revolution, as functions were differentiated, some were pastors, others were farmers, others were craftsmen, others were priests, others were traders, uh, a polytheistic uh, notion of God arose. There were, there were gods with different functions and different roles. And that later on, as I think your question was suggesting, uh, the, the notion arose out of polytheism that uh, there was just one God, and uh, the attempt was made then to take these various roles and put them uh, back together again. That's uh, speaking now in terms of something more like the sociology of religion than the psychology of religion. Speaking uh, uh, psychologically, I think one, one should say that um, multiple uh, personality isn't always multiple personality disorder. Uh, and in the West, we owe uh, our own fondness for inner multiplicity uh, to the fact that we worshipped uh, for such a long time a god who had his own uh, inner multiplicity. Uh, it has been for us a source of dynamism, a source of creativity. It has given our uh, civilization part of its distinctive shape. It's also uh, perhaps the cause of our, uh, one of the causes of our pain and, uh, and our uh, neurosis. Should we uh, ourselves seek more integration than we have? Uh, we can ask that question as we ask whether it would have been good for God to go beyond fusion without integration to perfect integration. The answer might be yes, but it might be no. I mean, think of Rilke, uh, speaking of psychoanalysis, if they take away my devils, they may also take away my angels. Both, both uh, uh, perspectives, I think, have a, you're shaking your head, you disagree. You like integration. Yes. <laughs> we have time for still two questions. The, the first is of uh, Hendrik Kuhn. Yes. Will you, will you ask your question yourself? Uh, you can read it. Okay. Did Jesus pray to a divided God? I always understood his reference to God as summed up in the scheme love to God, to self, and neighbor. Did Jesus pray to a divided God is an extremely uh, interesting question, actually. Uh, I don't, I don't, I think the answer is probably no, uh, I mean, this, this is, of course, speculative and imaginative and, and creative or outrageous or what have you on, on my part. Uh, but the, the, the greatest single fact of, uh, of, of Jewish history is that God did not keep his promise. He, he said that uh, he would restore his people after the Babylonian conquest to even greater glory than they had had before, and he didn't do it. They all knew he didn't do it. And the, the, the brief restoration uh, under the Persians was followed by worse oppression under the Greeks and still worse oppression under the Romans. And every Jew in the, in the first uh, century before the turn of the era and the first century after, afterward knew that. Uh, and knew that, uh, and, and at that time also, came a great growth in the, in the uh, habit of referring to God as Father. This, is, this did not originate with Jesus. He certainly developed it, uh, and Christianity developed it. But, but the, one of the most familiar prayers in, in Judaism is uh, Avinu Malkenu, our Father, uh, our King. That, uh, combine those two facts, a sense of intimacy between an individual Jew and God and an acute sense that God has failed, then what happens? Then you have something that approaches saying, I have failed. I, who am so close to God, I have failed. Then what happens? Well, that's, that's the subject of my next book. <laughs> Last question. The more I realize how much we have made God a reflection of ourselves, the more I understand how an increasing number of people 
um, are attracted to Buddhism. Buddhism um, tracks the transcending of the self and the annihilation of the ego. So does modern day fusion. What are the cultural factors that have made Judeo Christianity, as well as Judaism, so self referential? Yes. Uh, that's a very good question, and I was attracted to Buddhism, uh, as I said before, for very much this, uh, this reason. Uh, it, it, uh, Judaism believes in a kind of acosmic uh, monism. The world is, is just one thing, but it's not an ordered thing. And anything that appears to be ordered, uh, such as your own consciousness, is, is illusory. Uh, so are such things as the laws of physics or anything that might be called the laws of, histor of, of history, anything that, let's say, a Hegel uh, might find. This is um, a, a reconciliation to death by way of saying that life is only uh, illusory. Therefore, the opposition between life and death is, uh, is nothing much to worry about. Uh, and uh, one's own thought processes from which desire originates, and this sense that things are real uh, originate, uh, is t to be overcome by the uh, process of uh, meditation. It is very um, attractive in, in that way, but uh, what finally uh, halted my own uh, progress in that direction was um, something that in in me that recoiled from one of the consequences of this, which was an appalling indifference to uh, human suffering. Uh, Buddhism uh, calls on uh, humans to refrain from causing suffering, but would regard it as simply another form of folly <coughs> to engage very actively in alleviating suffering. And without having a ra quite a rational way to explain uh, my attachment to, to doing that, uh, I, I, I opted for it, uh, <coughs> and therefore against Buddhism in my own life. Now, I'm sure that some Buddhists would regard my summary there as, as quite a slander, but, uh, but the, I, I recognize, you know, that there isn't, if I weren't a, a Christian, I would be a Buddhist. It's a, it has, a, has great uh, uh, natural appeal and the, I think some of the most interesting conversations that are taking place are taking place between Christians and Buddhists. In fact, one person who, I, I wonder, does anyone here know, recognize the name Frederick Frank? Yeah. Frederick Frank is a, a Dutch artist who's a close friend of mine. He's an 80-year-old man uh, who has written very interestingly on uh, Buddhism, who publishes in a, in a journal called Eastern Buddhist, which is, uh, you know, f in particular for Japanese, uh, uh, you know, Ma Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, he also, uh, with his own hands, essentially uh, built a shrine to uh, Pope John Paul the Twenty Third in a in a rural corner of uh, New York State, uh, and has has I think been uh, quite a force for uh, ecumenical uh, conversation. Uh, and also conversation, you might say, between artists and believers of all kinds in, in, in the United States. So uh, I, I certainly don't believe that the last word has been said on that, uh, that subject. Thank you for, uh, for your wonderful questions. You're a terrific audience. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Antoine.